properties are being converted to Airbnb that is robbing the community of long-term rental opportunities. So whether that's true or not, historically, Shandaken has been bereft of long-term rental opportunities. And we're hearing from a lot of people who are firmly in the middle class who simply can't afford to live here because there are no long-term rentals. Is there any talk or any thought or any avenue uh, to use the municipal powers of Shandaken to develop more long-term rentals so people who want to live here can, in fact, live here? I think it's a great question. And, and you know, because we have not in Shandaken, in, at least so far as I understand it, we have not, since, since the Sharp Committee has no longer been uh, uh, active, <clears throat> we've, had, we've had a real dearth of new housing starts and, and you know, the ability to try to find some affordable, try to create affordable housing in town. Um, I, I, I mean, I would love to see us be able to begin a program where we might be able to actually have the town, you know, work with an appropriate agency, uh, whether it's Rupco or others, to begin to, to, to do this. Um, I think whether that or not that will affect in any genuinely meaningful way the, the stock of, of the long-term rental housing in the town, it seems unlikely. I mean, I think it's a, it's a worthy effort, but I don't know how much good we're actually being able to, to you know, accomplish that way. I think we should look at it, and I think we need to try. Yeah. I think there's, uh, you know, with the, long, the, the STR thing going on, I, I think, uh, I'm hoping there's a, a cyclical process to this, and that, you know, some people who have come in and bought homes and thrown them on short-term rentals, will see, oh, you know, maybe I'll put one of my houses on as a long-term rental or one of my units or whatever. Um, it's, it's nothing, I don't think a, a municipality can't make a private landowner, you know, have their home as short-term or, or long-term. We can't tell somebody in that way what to do. Uh, you can tell them how to paint it. <laughs> Can't do that. But you can have regulations. But you can have regulations yeah. that will limit it. And and as you know, Mark, you're on that committee, and we're we're working towards some kind of regulation. And a, a smart regulation is what we need to. And we'll have to have a whole town, you know, open open house about it, and really talk about it publicly, and have many public meetings about. It what direction the town really wants to go. Well, I think the very least looks like some kind of reconfiguration of, or, or addendum to the zoning laws, to existing zoning laws. I agree. I think that really has to start to revisit all of the zoning laws and, and a, a comprehensive plan for our, for our town uh, is overdue by a lot, uh, and that should be part of it, because we have a policy we want to have uh, with short-term rentals, long-term rentals, Housing. I think housing is it would be one of my biggest priorities because I see it everywhere I go and it's it's been talked about and um, I hear the same story. But we don't want to jeopardize the people who are already depending on short-term rentals as hosts for their like for being able to pay their bills. We don't want to remove that option from people who are already depending on it. Um, so it's it's a balance that needs to be looked at and, and looked at from all angles. And I think the short term rental committee is doing that. I'm, I'm glad, Mark, that you're in charge. And uh, it looks like it's very promising that you'll actually come up with some solutions. Thank you. Yeah. Do, get, do get Rupco to come and talk to you. They're smart people. They're, they know where the money is. Mm -hmm. They know how you can package something. We're not going to have a huge thing. I mean. For, for Phoenicia, five units is a lot, but it's better than nothing. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. If I may call you that. <laughs> Thank you. Vivian, you mentioned the comprehensive plan, and I, a lot of what we're all talking about, about green, about energy efficiency, about housing, about uh, just the kind of town that we want, we aspire for, is all should be in a comprehensive plan, something that we all come together and say, this is really Absolutely. what we want, 
And this is the road to get there. Otherwise, any road will get you there if you don't know where you're going. So yes. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, because I know we have a comprehensive plan, but I think it's pretty old. And what would you do to refresh it? Well, the planning board at their last meeting brought up the, uh, their idea that it was actually their responsibility to initiate um, a new comprehensive plan committee to discuss what needs to be in it. I'm not sure what their plan is, is how to constitute it, who's going to be in it, how they're going to make that decision. But um, certainly something a lot of people have an interest in. Uh, it's way overdue. It's supposed to be done, I think, every five years. But no, none of the towns are able to do that. That's a little bit. Out of, the, out of reach. But I know there are towns in Austin County that have recently done new comprehensive plans. The SOAP is, for one, is um, really pretty speedy uh, to get to that point. And I, so I know it can be done. I, I think we have um, some good people who can work on it. Um, and uh, like you said, there's issues in the old comp plan that were not addressed and need to be. I, I'd also like to just add a few things on, this, on the subject of Shandaken's comprehensive plan. You know, many of us remember what a difficult process it was the last time Shandaken undertook this. Um, <coughs> we, the, the, I believe our current comprehensive plan was adopted in the summer of 2005, and we, after three different <coughs> committees had been constituted to try and to try to put this thing together, um, the last. The current comprehensive plan that we have was adopted by the third and final comprehensive plan committee, which consisted of Chuck Perez, uh, who was the chairman, Rob Stanley, who was the secretary, and was I think Harry, two, two other, two other, um, it was Harry and Declan, I believe it was Harry, Harry Jameson and Declan Field, I think. There were four members of that committee. That final committee was, was constituted <clears throat> because the previous committee had been dissolved in a certain, in a significant amount of rank. But just to, to understand the process that had happened there, Shandig was trying to put together a long-term plan, a comprehensive plan, at the height of our town's own internal debate over the proposed Bell and Resort project. And so what happened was that, you know, you had people from both sides advocating very strongly. Uh, on the one hand, you had, you had people looking to, to restrict the possibility of the size and density of the resort, and you had other people who were looking to make sure that there were no restrictions whatsoever. And so there were, you know, the, the plan, there, there, was, there was an awful lot of conflict. Um, those, those meetings were very contentious for a long period of time. Um, <clears throat> eventually, uh, the plan that was adopted is a plan that has no restrictions on density, no restrictions on the size of proposed developments. I mean, these are these are things that most communities would routinely put in their comprehensive plan, and which are glaringly absent from ours. So, you know, these the comprehensive planning process is a really critical one, but you know, it's also one that has to be. It's going to take a long period of time, it's going to take a lot of input, and it's going to take a lot of good faith on the people trying to, to put that plan together to make it work. I think we need to do it. I think we need to think about how we could reconstitute such a committee. And by the way, when I look at the way the process is working and how well the process is working, for example, with the STR committee, it's very hopeful to me. It really suggests that we're in a position now where we could really put together a comprehensive plan for me that could work together. You know, I really feel like the dialogue in Shandaken has has advanced significantly since the time, since those earlier times of conflict. I think we're in a position now where we could find, create a good comprehensive plan for them over the time, work up, you know, come up with a plan that, that people will be happy with. And I'd just like to hear other thoughts that people have on our comp plan process, because I've been Pontificating a bit on the subject, but I really want to hear what. Well, I think, I think you hit it all, and it, it, it isn't going to happen by the end of the year. So, whoever the new administration is or the old administration coming in, it, it's something that definitely needs to be revisited. And, and, like you said, laws for STRs when they get put into the, into the zoning code 
you know, that's all going to have to be addressed in a comprehensive plan. And it, it, I know the planning board's been sending notes to the town board asking them to revisit the comprehensive plan again, so it's, it's time, it's long overdue. Yeah. Yeah. I think we all uh, can recognize the impact and the transformation of the, the economy is transforming because of the internet platform worldwide. And uh, it's hard to see that in a local town like this. But if you take a look at the transformation of this kind of thing, like a platform like Airbnb, that enables people who have a property to live <coughs> here and make a living. You, you realize that that's here and it's not, hopefully, not going to go away or be curbed too much that overall our town wouldn't meet the benefits of it. But more importantly, what is the role of a small town right now? Like we were talking about the sidewalks in Phoenicia, and somebody was saying, well, I don't know, there was something signed maybe 20, 30 years ago. We could try to find it. It's in a box somewhere. Okay, so we can no longer afford to have that kind of technology driving our town. So part of a comprehensive plan is looking at zoning, looking at things like the internet and how that's affecting our everyday lives here and we really have to update it but looking at it from a, a, quite a different point of view and really updating the technology impact on all of us. That's a very excellent way of putting it, yes. Um, yeah, with the, a little bit with the comprehensive plan, my question to all of you is, this kind of fits into it. How are you going to, since we are an aging out community here, the people who live here full time, um, how are you going to address attracting younger people to this area who want to live here, work here, raise their family? Well, I, I see what's happening in Kingston. They are attracting younger people in Kingston. They are having more activities, more places for them to gather, more uh, small businesses started by young people. It is becoming a thriving younger community. And since we are commuting distance from them, I, I see some hope there. And, and you know, the housing situation is, is key to bringing people uh, from that economy who want to live here. I, I think encouraging cottage industry, including STRs, is a big part of that. Yes, and, and the STRs do employ people who are living in the community. So that's part of the a local economy as well. It may not be something that's visible, but it's certainly uh, uh, becoming a, a significant in scale that there are people who would be put out of work if STRs were, um, were out of business. Well, just, just a, I mean, when you, when you look at, at the number of STRs functioning in town, we think it's probably 150 to 200 at this point. Um, you know, you talk about something like 20% of the housing in Shandake, but it's in the households in Shandake are, are directly tied to the SDR economy. So it's a very significant contributor to, to Shandake's overall well-being in the same way that, that the traditional lodging industry, um, you know, employs about like, you know, a similar number of people in families. I mean, these are relatively comparable industries in, in Shandaken at this moment. And you know, it was interesting when, when uh, Pat Ryan was, was here at this town hall a couple of months ago, and the subject, we talked about the subject of SDRs. The first thing that he said about it, I thought was rather strange, he said there really is, you know, there's no one size fits all. You know, every community needs to sort this out for themselves. You know, the wealthier communities, Woodstock and Marbletown, for example, were, you know, really rather restrictive in the way that they that they've recently dealt with this, and I think that um, uh, if we had attempted to do something like that in Shandaken, that it would have been um, very problematic. I actually believed from some of my earlier conversations on the subject with, with Rob that that was his intention here, and, and originally I thought that his first STR committee was, was hopeful to institute regs, and I thought might have been overly restrictive, but I really think that was very happy with the way that that first committee survey went out and was responded to and, and, uh, and then was received back by the committee because they looked at it and they said, you know what, there's a lot of points of view about this here. People really want to, people are open to this conversation and they want to understand 
how these things are really going to affect us before we uh, start talking about how we, you know, finally regulate them. So, I mean, although I think the discussion, the whole SDR regulation issue will probably come to a successful conclusion fairly soon, um, I think that we needed to slow the process down. We did slow it down, and Chandaken's going to be, Chandaken will benefit from it. Since we're talking about young people, the young person wanted to ask a question. Go ahead. What is one issue that you... Louder, please stand up. Um, what is one issue in particular that you would really like to work on and change that you feel, yeah, like you personally could help the community with more than anybody else? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to take a shot at that one. Well, all, all I could say is that when I first joined uh, the town board and I, you know, I, I'm, I come from a restaurant and uh, I'm management and I'm an owner and I just wanted to do everything and I wanted to do it as quickly as possible, just like getting out food. But we're, we, we have to work, we have to work as a team. Uh, no matter who we are on the board, we have to be able to sit down and discuss things and come to an agreement, make some compromises. Uh, I'm not trying to say that doing things is, is bad, it's good, but we need to have a, a united goal to get things done. It's, it's tough getting things done in town government. Cool. Well, for me, for me, the issue that, that, that is dear to my heart, that I, that I feel like I want to address, is, is the issue of how we look to try to bring some additional revenue into all of our towns in the watershed because of the really critical role that we serve, we are towns, these Catskill and Delaware watersheds serve for the state of New York. You know, I mean, it's a, I think I raised this issue briefly at the outset here, but it, it's important to me and I want to talk about it. I mean, I first became involved in, in town policy, town dealings in Shandaken um, through our former supervisor, Neil Grant, many years ago. And Neil was the guy on, on whose watch we had to deal with the issue of the 1996 memorandum of agreement with the city of New York. Um, ultimately, all of the towns in the watershed signed on to that agreement. Shandaken was the last town in the watershed to sign on. And part of that delay was uh, Neil and I fighting constantly on whether or not we could do this or, or, or shouldn't do it. And I didn't believe we should do it. I believed we needed to hold out for a different kind of settlement than we ultimately got. You all may remember, some of you may remember, um, Shandaken has a large amount, I think we have 53 some thousand acres in the watershed. We, and, and towns were compensated by acreage, and we had one of the largest payments uh, for, uh, which were called good neighbor payments from the city of New York at the time. That was signed on. Shandaken's payment, I think, was about $610,000. And, you know, town boards have been carefully shepherding that fund. It's diminishing, but, you know, it's basically been used very wisely over the years. The reality is, we shouldn't have received the settlement of 600000 We should have received the settlement more like five or six or eight million dollars for that, for what Shandaken gave up. And I am not ready to let that battle go, and I haven't been ready for 20 years or more. I really think that this is something watershed towns need to be able to do. They need to be able to reclaim a different relationship with the city of New York than we currently have. Now, I think <clears throat> that our, our relationship, our ability to negotiate things like septic systems in Phoenicia and those things, those are important and critical things that, that we need to maintain with DEP and with the city of New York. But I also think that we need to find another way to monetize the sacrifices that we as, our, as watershed towns make for the benefit of the rest of the state. I mean, literally these waters from our streams are keeping half of New York State alive, and we need to go back into the state budget, we need to deal with the governor's office, we need to find whatever the right structural approach is so that these watershed towns can be compensated for what we give up under the MOA. We, all of our, all of our watershed towns suffer from, you know, these same issues of infrastructure problems, cell, lack of cell service, and there's a range of things 
but the problems are all common to our watershed towns. They're not big in scale for New York State. They're small in scale, but for us, they're big numbers that we can't afford. You know, go put up a, you know, 200 foot cell towers, a couple hundred thousand dollars. The state can deal with that, and we can't. So I think that, you know, as a, just to bring this back to what this is, a personal issue for me, I think that, that for me, what we need is real leadership in the watershed. We need, pe we need people who are willing to go and, and, and re and begin again this, this issue of trying to fund what we need for our, for our towns right here from money, you know, from funds that, are, that can be made available from the rest of the state. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you all go walk on that rail trail. On, on West the Hurley Rail Trail, 11 and a half miles. Mm -hmm. New York City not only agreed to let people on the rail trail, but they basically put in three or four million dollars of their own money so that people could piss in their water. <laughs> Extraordinary. Uh, uh, so that they could not piss in their water. They could walk on. Sorry, okay. So, uh, you know, and the state puts money, everybody put in money. You basically, you, you, you want to make the case. And I'm, I, I think, starting with Brian's point of view, that they owe us something is not a bad start. But then you've got to negotiate. I've got to lobby you. Yeah. Vivian, Sir? What about you, Vivian? Vivian? Yeah. Before you go to the next one, Vivian had a response. Oh, on yes. sorry. We had this response, and then you, your turn. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, so I, what I feel that I'm, I'm called to do as my role quite, quite often is to make connections between resources and problems, um, similar to what Brian was saying. The county is a good resource for solving problems, um, and sometimes it's very simple to call on them. There was a, a time, in, um, I guess a year ago, when the uh, rail bikes were coming into being, and there was a, a town meeting at which two uh, people close to the rail bike um, route were very concerned uh, that their quality of life would be down the tubes because of the constant traffic from the rail bikes. They said it was going to be noisy, people were going to be invading their privacy, and, you know, it was going to happen all day long, every day, and, and in, in a way that was pretty factual uh, for those two people. And then nobody did anything, but since I knew who to go to in the county, I went to Chris Murphy, who was the project director for the rail trail and also um, for the rail bike, uh, for the whole system. And he said, oh, no problem. I'll go and talk to them, see what they want. He got a fence put up at the county's expense, solved the whole problem. But that's the kind of thing I feel that it's easy enough for me to do because I can see like a bigger picture of what the resources are. So, <coughs> and one other thing that happened recently, uh, Sofas Avenue has got big giant potholes, drainage problem, hasn't been repaved since uh, the street was torn up. Um, I went to town hall because people were complaining to me and I see how it's like. They said, oh, you know, it's such a complicated situation. We can't do anything about it. Well, that's not acceptable. I certainly would not let that slide. And, and then they explained to me what the complications were. Well, OK, somebody's got to do something. We've got to get through the red tape. I mean, I think that that's something that when I see that happening, I can't let it sit. i got to get involved. i got to see what I can do. And you know, as a town board member, I think I'm in more of a position to be cutting through the red tape when I see a problem like that. I'm sure there's a lot of problems where that's necessary that have been let slide and nothing's been done. Quality of life issues that could really be fixed if we put our mind to it. So two of the problems that I see that we have up here is number one, cell towers and also bringing people, young families, to stay here and also bringing other people to come live here. And over the years, uh, internet business has grown where a lot, a lot of people are able to work from home because their companies allow it and they have internet businesses or whatever. But the problem is that a lot of people may not come to this area to live here full time because they are unable to have 
a business from their home that they can operate on the internet because it's a lack of cell service. So, and besides the, that fact, the importance of cell service for first responders is crucial. Yeah. So my question is, uh, well my thought is that if we can increase the cell service in the area and get cell towers up where everybody can have service, you're going to bring people here to live here, to increase the population, bring the younger people here that work in that type of industry. So to do that, what do you propose that you can do to try to get cell towers in this area so that we can have full coverage for the benefit of everybody? That's a great question, yeah. <coughs> so, okay. So, <coughs> I think we all recognize this is an absolute necessity in the modern world. We have to have this. Now in September, um, Governor Cuomo instituted a new um, cell tower uh, group, a new committee for the Catskills and the Adirondacks. Uh, I believe Jeff Sanderman is representing us locally for that. And it's a brand new group. We don't know exactly what their time frame looks like. They are attempting, as I understand it, to deal with this as the emergency that it really is. And you know, it's possible that within some number of months we might start to get some recommendations or some actual potentially even some funding through that. We don't know yet. But but let's just take our cell tower issues back back here to Shandai a little bit. Um, even many years ago, we all recognized that this was going to be a critical thing. And, and, and we had an opportunity, I'm going to ask you, Kathy, to talk about this in just a moment, but we had an opportunity some years back um, where there was a I believe the year was around 2004, 2005. But what had happened was a group of several people, Kathy, Adam, Navy, maybe one or two others, had worked on putting together a cell service plan for Shandaken. That plan was based on building, I think, five, maybe six towers, 70 to 90 feet tall, to be located at each of the firehouses in Shandaken.